Okay. I can tell you the old password. No, that's okay. I lay upon my dreams at your feet. <laughs> that's a long password. <laughs> Tough for you tread on my dreams. All right, you about ready? No. All right, tell me when. Check one, two. Hey, everybody. Welcome to 231. Harry, have you been smoking? You smell cigar-like. Have you been smoking? Actually, no. I, uh, I haven't smoked a cigar since, um, chairs, actually. Oh. And before that, I haven't smoked a cigar since Gunther. And I didn't know cigar. if you were an everyday uh, cigar smoker or not. <sighs> you know what? I used to be, or close to it, up until Gunther was, um... Uh, the whole uh, the whole Gunther the whole child thing yeah because <laughs> one I couldn't smoke in the house I was forced to smoke out in the somewhere else I can't smoke in the car in the garage because there's too much things that'll catch me on fire right so I had to smoke in the Subaru which I had a lot of fun sitting in the back of the Subaru just sitting there smoking cigars <laughs> okay you know because it's a station wagon I can lay down <laughs> uh, but <laughs> All right, but I but empty after I emptied my humidor, I just kind of just I keep the humidity on it. And I just haven't gone and like put more cigars in it yet. No, just haven't felt like it because oh, I just shit. don't. Also, I don't find the time to smoke because the doctors told me that if I smoke my cigar, I have to basically change my clothes. Right, so it's a whole pain in the ass. Right, and I was like, right. well, I got my robe. Well, yeah, you have to still have to change. You should still change everything that could possibly smell like it because it could cause asthma for the child. Right. And, you know, and whether it's an old wife child or not, or what? If the, because this is a nurse is telling me this, I'm so freaked out of doing something that would impact. I would be so freaked out the whole time. It's, it's, it's with everything, like like the whole vaccine things. When they give you vaccines, and you're like reading all these MSDS sheet, you're like, I have, you know, I have kind of a knowledge of what I'm getting ready to inject in this child. Right. And it's the worst ones. Like, okay, these are the common ones, right? It's the optional ones. All the optional ones they give you, and you're like, huh? <laughs> There's optional. Va- it's like, it's like first, you're like, what? Why are there optional vaccines? Two. Shouldn't they all be optional? Right. <laughs> what do you mean the rest of these aren't optional? If I don't sign these, you technically can't give this, so it's all these are optional. Well, we wouldn't let... I was like, screw you. Right. And I'm not here... To, and please don't send me your conspiracy theories on vaccines or <laughs> hit me on Twitter about vaccines. Have you gotten a lot of that? Actually, No. No, I haven't. I, I I don't know if I just weeded enough of them out of my life or everyone just think I'm so woke AF that, oh, he knows. <laughs> we don't have to Well, sit. the fluoride shower head thing, <laughs> that helps. All right, are you ready? Uh, no, my computer can blow it off after and like, turn it back on. Oh, my God, on Harry, shadow. this is four minutes. Four minutes I've been ready to go. I, like, I, like, I can't. Two minutes after you got home? Uh, I had been here for an hour, but I had been playing Mario Kart, so. <laughs> so you do game. Oh, well, does game. Only Mario Kart 4, and then the... Oh, oh. Then Clash of Clans on uh, the, the mobile. And I played that for like three or four or five years. Why well, do you let me bring Super Smash Bros. and get on that? I've got a Wii. That's what I got. I can bring Super Smash Bros. for the GameCube and put it in the Wii. We can stream it on the Black Magic. <laughs> Forced gamesmanship. Yep. Of course, the one thing I do want to do, I still want to do Artemis. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh-huh. Walt does Artemis. Do it at uh, Jared because he's got the space for it. Right. Let Dear Leader X be captain of the ship and see if we can survive. What is Artemis? Artemis is a, a bridge simulator game. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, think of Star Trek. Right. So everyone's got their uh, positions on the bridge. And you basically have got to go do the mission. So you've got a pilot, someone on weapons, engineering, communications, science Focus officer. Focus on the computer, Harry. Science officer. And uh, that's what... And so everyone just listen. So you, your leader, would take the right. captain's chair. You would sit there in the center, and you would basically bark out orders and hopefully make sure we survive and make it through everything. Well, as you know, I am a 
I, I like Kim Il Sung, am a great, great art marshal uh, on the field. When in reality, Kim Il Sung, like they they brag about how great of a of a general he was mm-hmm. because he took over. He was actually cowering in a bunker almost the entire Korean War. He wasn't allowed to be in charge of his own war. He he wasn't allowed to be in charge when the Soviets took over North Korea. He was actually a really shitty military general. It's really funny. I, I doubt that. You know, that's not the history lesson. You know, yeah, that was taught in schools. All right, you ready? Well, when you let someone in your private, uh, uh, nothing. Sorry, sock, sock puppet <laughs> stuff. You need to focus. We have a you, l- you, you focus, Harry. We have we have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten topics tonight when we normally have three. I know. I have no idea how we're going to do this. I have this no idea get quick either. Because, like, I'm so autistic on the Equifax thing, I don't know how I'm going to get through that. I'm going to I'm gonna leave you as much time as I possibly can. Okay. And if, But there's just so much to talk about. We've got to get through this stuff. Okay. All right, you ready? Yep. Okay. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. I'm your host, Chris Spangle. We Are Libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves. Think of us as the love child of National Review and Mad Magazine. We explain to you what the hell is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently. Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, share this episode with friends, and support us through Patreon at WeAreLibertarians.com. We are supported by listeners like you, so $1 per episode by pledging $5 a month helps us grow. We are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at WeAreLibertarians.com. If you're new to the program, uh, on the Thursday episodes we talk for 20 minutes, but we've got so much to talk about tonight, we're going to get right into topics uh, after after a little uh, introduction here. And then we're going to deep dive into analyzing current events in society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned, the language is strong and offensive. I am your host, Chris Spangle, and with me is Harry Price. Harry, how are you? Going good, energetic, ready for this episode. We've got a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this is this huge list. I can't believe, when you sent this list over the Facebook, I was like, whoa, are you sure there's, we're going to hit all this? There's ten topics. Healthcare demands, Graham Cassidy is dead, the Alabama Senate race, should Twitter ban Trump? Obama warns Facebook over face, fake ads, and social media propels AFD into the German Reich, and then Equifax. But first, Harry. Come on, Harry. What? Let's kneel. What? I'm going to kneel. Are we kneeling? I'm, I'm kneeling in solidarity with you, Harry. <laughs> I'm kneeling down. Uh, Harry, why aren't you kneeling? Gotta, Harry, gotta I thought you people gotta kneel. kneeled. Got to kneel. You got to lock arms and kneel. Oh, we got to lock. I can't get all the way around there. Got to. Oh, gotta, well. Gotta lock arms. I just, I just wanted to. Get, s- oh, there we go. <clears throat> start the show, Harry. Um, you know, you being uh, an African American gentleman, mm-hmm. I know that you were, are certainly going to kneel <laughs> at the beginning of the national anthem, as uh, you people tend to do. First off, uh, my peoples uh, it's usually just sit through the national anthem. Right. It's just easier. It's comfier. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, okay. Or you make a beeline to the beer. Right. You easily, like, that's the one time you should um, you easily get to the bathroom of the beer at the stadium is when everyone's doing, like, their, um, their, their prayer to the flag. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, Whitney, thank you, thank you, Whitney, for uh, for chiming in there. I just that was actually Greg's idea. Shocked that Greg came up with the uh, mm-hmm. the idea for <laughs> me to make you feel racially uncomfortable. But um, yeah, so we're, we're not going to talk about the NFL protest too much because, quite frankly, I think everybody, you and I, are sick of it. I'm sure everybody else is sick of, to death of it. Where's the clap track? I do feel like we should touch on it because it is the thing that everybody's talking. If you look at our Facebook page, uh, the big page, not the group, which you can join at uh, wearelibertarians.com, the the page is just off the charts right now. Mm-hmm. People are losing their mind over it. Yeah, and it's it's nuts because they one they assume uh, well what our position is and just, right or t- t- trying to uh, change our position on everything. And um, I remember when Chris was showing me a lot of it, I was like, they assume a lot of us watch football. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm happy you people aren't going to be watching and worshipping football because, let me be honest, you're worshipping other men's accomplishments as they play children's games, not actually living your life, and you're just distracting yourself from your family and kids, mm -hmm. and you probably wouldn't have a divorce rate of 60% if everybody didn't just spend all their time playing video games and watching football. All winter long. First off, you leave video games alone. Video games are modern day novels or interactive. Uh, sure, they are. But uh, when it comes to watching grown men play ch uh, children's sports, eh, it's kind of a, kind of ridiculous. Um, as someone who goes to like gaming conventions, especially Gen Con here in Indy, uh, it's very annoying to do go to Gen Con and have to be sit there on because the sports ball team wants to have their preseason game. So you right. got all these people downtown, you know meshed in with all these nerds and it's they get kind of annoying they get kind of drunk they get you know and they like to make fun of other people who aren't into the same thing when they do the exact same thing everyone at gen con is doing they've got cosplayers there you yeah know? no here's the thing everything is i don't i don't it's just i remember thinking this first at a bw3s a couple years ago and I was sitting next to a table and I, uh, of mid-40s men, mm -hmm. and they were all, there were about five of them sitting at a table at dinner, hanging out. And they talked for 45 minutes about uh, nothing but fairy tale football. And I was just like, you know, you're spending 45 minutes with your friends and all you can manage to come up with is fairy tale football. Like, it just seems so superficial to me. But, you know, to each his own. Correct, yeah. To each but, his own. Yeah, do what you do, like, what makes you happy. Like, hey, I could spend four hours a night with my buddies, and we can sit there and just deep dive into, like, a game. Right. But when we're going on advent imaginary adventures, telling stories with each other. That's what I'm doing. Don't make fun of what I'm doing, and I will leave you alone as long as you're having fun, not hurting anybody. Yeah. So here is my... Uh, Here's my take on the NFL uh, stuff, and I've, I've been very vocal on my Facebook. You're, you're welcome to go follow me on Facebook or follow our Facebook page or add our group, at mm -hmm. Harry, at Greg, at Cat, whatever. Um, the First off, Donald Trump is distracting from the fact that he the Graham Cassidy health care bill went down in flames on Friday, and he needed a distraction, and so he threw red meat to his base and he knew everybody would be a useful idiot and, and take it up. And a useful idiot is a communist term, essentially, where you are, you're taking a red meat subject like this and you're turning people into propagandists because they argue over nonsense, mm -hmm. thereby distracting from the real issues. And so this is definitely a distraction issue. We've, we've maintained the whole time that this is what Donald Trump does. He, he does something on Twitter that will distract from the fact that there's something major happening. That kind of backfired this weekend because uh, Maria hitting Puerto Rico has really turned into a very serious situation in Puerto Rico, and it's now going to be his Katrina moment. And then he didn't, he didn't have the foresight to shut up <laughs> like yeah. normal, and in the press conference today said, you know, I'm getting tremendous reviews for how I'm handling Puerto Rico and everybody's going from who? Like, <laughs> like there's. I mean, it was definitely a you're doing a hell of a job brownie moment, mm -hmm. and I think you're going to see the uh, Puerto Rico Katrina uh, narrative start to really pop up here through the rest of this week, and uh, because it's it's a very serious situ situation. We're not going into much detail beyond this uh, to touch on it because there's not much to say. I mean, it's it's. Uh, you know, there there are some news stories that I think are of interest to libertarians in that uh, the uh, airlines are now bashing the administration, saying we tr we tried to fly fifty thousand pounds of supplies and you turned us back. The TSA won't let us lane, lane load yeah. up planes. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who are not able to get on the plane because they have no electricity there, so they can't check the no fly list. They can't Correct. check all these various uh, security checks, and so people aren't able to get on a plane and come here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that while I don't have a problem with that, it as of right now, I mean, that goes into a larger immigration debate. It would You would think that the United States government would make that a priority to help get people out of that situation. Yeah, you, you would think that. And that's also a sucky thing that why, um, you know, 
federal air 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 traffic is controlled by the FAA. They freaking suck at their job. Right. Uh, they really can't really enforce it other than levying fines at gigantic companies. Mm-hmm. You can see that with drone um, people using these like um, unnamed drones everywhere, violating a uh, no. <laughs> No fly space all across the country. Right, but for this, it's ridiculous to because like any person can uh, can probably float up a plane and bring stuff there, but they can't jump as simple as that because the federal government controls the air. Exactly. And the other simple thing you think about it, like the United States government like cannot like get a, like a tablet out there you know with a generator to check list and just scan people in or have like a satellite or a satcom. He, it's well, ridiculous because what uh, you know, like they could do that for Survivor and everywhere else, but they can't do it here. That sucks. He he. Well, listen, it's it's very difficult there because it's on an island. It's surrounded by water. It's mm-hmm. not like Florida. Like it, okay, well, <laughs> it, if it were, if he weren't the president, it'd be like it's we're the greatest country in the world. We can't get boats there, so they are deploying things there. It is a very serious situation, but. You know, yes. so to to move on back to the protests, I will say that uh, Colin Kaepernick, I don't know how many people know this, but the reason that Colin Kaepernick, who was half white, half black, mm-hmm. who has the uh, about the same devotion and outspokenness on his Christian faith as Tim Tebow, mm-hmm. uh, the reason that he sat on the bench the first time, some sports fans say that he sat on the bench the first anthem because he was pouting because he didn't start. Correct. He but, was out of uniform. Right. But then. He later on would say that, uh, well, I did it because I was protesting for this country and and uh, essentially saying I don't want to support a country and a flag that allows the systematic killing of black men. And uh, it turned into a pretty big protest, a big, a big kerfuffle, which ended up moving him out of the league. And by all standards, he should have a job, especially here in Indianapolis, where we really need a, we really need a, a quarterback. And... Uh, so, but fans threatened to revolt if they brought him here, and it was something that Trump picked up on, and so when he needed a distraction, you know, on Friday, he went out there and said that coaches should uh, should fire anybody who doesn't stand for the national anthem because they're not patriotic. And I, I would say that a person who is making a political statement in a very peaceful way against government abuse is doing something that is patriotic and it is on their first amendment it is uh, their first amendment right to do so without the president of the united states criticizing a private citizen for doing so and so he is he's the president is really out of line and i think that if you're a libertarian you are the last line of defense for many of the bill of rights Mm -hmm. and you are the natural heirs to the founding fathers who wrote the Bill of Rights, and you should take it very seriously when the President of the United States comes out and says you shouldn't protest government abuse. That being said, I do understand that people don't want their politics and their entertainment mixing. But citizenship is uh, a very hard thing, and sometimes you're going to have discomfort in, in places where you need discomfort because you are paying attention there because you've tuned out the uncomfortable images of Ferguson, so he's going to bring it to the 49er Stadium, and you will see it there. And his peaceful protest caused enough stir that the President of the United States noticed it, and that it became a part of a national dialogue. And as libertarians, when your rights are being taken away, let me be honest, you're not going to give a shit if that's taking place when when you're protesting during a football game, the Oscars, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just... I I always try to give uh, people who I disagree with the benefit of the doubt. You know, would I – I'll never be in Colin Kaepernick's situation. You know, I've built an audience uh, doing this. uh, But obviously it's it's to each his own. But I I just don't find the uh, argument that you should have these things segmented away from each other to be a compelling argument in in a free society. Because that's not how a free society works. You're supposed to have a healthy debate. 
And what's sad is that I don't feel like we have a healthy debate over any of this stuff. Yeah, correct, yeah. Everyone's just blowing it out of proportion, and there's like, uh, kneeling is very disrespectful. I say disrespectful to your flag would be if they turned their back to it. Well, let me tell you why he kneels, so I didn't get to that. What did you say? I'm just saying, like, kneeling is like, it's different than turning your back and spitting on it and walking away. Well, but here's the thing. He used to sit on the bench, and then he had a conversation with a veteran who said that's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm not going to stop protesting. But I will kneel instead of sitting on the bench Mm -hmm. because then that's a half measure to show you that I respect your service. Mm -hmm. And instead, the president took that, didn't didn't ever find out that fact and perverted it into he's not a patriot. Right. And the patriotism argument is something we're going to be dealing with a lot, especially as I think that we're headed towards a war with North Korea. Because if you watch C-SPAN, like I did today with the Joint Chiefs uh, hearing, with the Senate, there was a Senate hearing on mm-hmm. his confirmation to be Joint Chiefs again. I, I mean, it sounds just like the lead up to the Iraq War, and it feels a lot like that. And uh, uh, libertarians, especially if you're a non interventionist, are going to be called unpatriotic by the tens of thousands across Facebook. So you should you should really get used to this whole "you're not a patriot" argument. Yeah. I mean, the the truth is that the flag is just a symbol. And the flag isn't just a symbol of soldiers. It's also a symbol of people like Martin Luther King. I mean, Correct, yeah. it's, it's a symbol of an entire country, and it's much more complex than just people who served in the military. Correct, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people who never wore a military uniform that died in defending this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, that flag, is uh, you're, you are not your flag, okay? <laughs> just like you are not your job. Uh, the other thing is that the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, that is, uh, you have to understand, that's not where your rights come from. This is a great conversation. I have a, I have a conversation with somebody is that your rights don't come from the Bill of Rights. Your rights don't come from a government. Your rights come from your creator. You are endowed by your creator with these rights. You have these rights whether, regardless of whether a sheet of paper hat says it or not. That sheet of paper is only there to tell the government they can't tread upon those rights. Right. That's it. So it's a great conversation to try to have with, like, if if you have that person on your on your thing that thinks that one is disrespectful, try to have that conversation about rights with that other person. When it has, when you've got someone that thinks this is right, stuff like that, and they've, they've got the right to do it, says on this sheet of paper, well, have that right conversation about them, too, about right. how this sheet of paper does not grant their rights. Right. Don't get pigeonholed into fighting the same arguments that those two sides are fighting. Correct. Have a different conversation with people, and they will. That novelty will make them go, "Oh, maybe there's something different about libertarians." And you don't have to defend either side. Any side you don't want to defend, or anything you don't feel comfortable defending. Don't think you have to defend one side or the other. Everyone's like, "You have to decide." No, you don't. <laughs> All right. So moving on, like I said, we normally do three topics. We've got ten this week because there's so much news that happened, and we want to get you all caught up. Uh, first, I want to say thank you. Uh, Carly Ernst uh, put us over the line today. We are now bringing in on our Patreon mm-hmm. at patreon.com slash wearelibertarians $1,001 a month, which in under one month we have uh, now had over $1,000 a month added to uh, what we do here at We Are Libertarians, mm-hmm. and that has just afforded us uh, a ton of resources, and we're going to continue to grow, and we're going to continue to uh, do more with that. I mean, because I have a full-time job, you guys have now helping, are, are taking over as an audience mm-hmm. the cost of running We Are Libertarians, and as the, as the revenue comes in, I'm going to spend it, because I want to give the libertarian movement more resources. So... You're really investing in the libertarian movement when you uh, donate mm-hmm. through our Patreon, and we give you bonus content. You're going to hear tomorrow on Wednesday, you're going to hear a super group of Johnny Rocket from Johnny Rocket Launchpad, Johnny Adams, uh, Mark Clare from Lions of Liberty, Roger Paxton of Lava Flow, and myself. Once a month, we'll re- be recording a special episode with each other called the League of Liberty. And uh, the League of Libertarian Podcasters, we, we talked about the Sarwark versus Tom Woods debate. We talk about our different approaches to our shows. So you're going to hear an hour and a half of extra content this week that will only be heard by our four audiences that are subscribers to our premium content. So it, it isn't going to be out free anywhere. It will be for our audiences because the four of us have premium content channels and we want to thank our subscribers and so this is what we're doing so 
you know, in addition to getting the show the night it's recorded on that feed and the private RSS feed that you can put in your reader. So, uh, end commercial, I just wanted to let you know that uh, your donations that were up to, uh, not donations, your, uh, the people who are giving through our <laughs> subscription service have uh, afforded us a lot of resources. And one of those is I am having the New York Times home delivered, Harry. What? I'm very fancy now. Uh, and uh, I, I was never more informed than when I got the Wall Street Journal in 2008 mm -hmm. at my house, and I would read the paper because it's just it's in your hand and it's a systematic layout. And I've never been able to really get into reading on a tablet or a phone or on the computer. <laughs> and so I got the Times home delivered, and I have read so much news. And the Sunday Times is so big that uh, you my Twitter feed, and therefore. We Are Libertarians Twitter feed was just full of different stories. I've been posting a bunch of different articles because I've been reading so much more news, and I think you're getting 10 topics tonight because of that. So you invest in us, then I am increasing my output. And uh, one of the things, and I would have never seen this story had it not been for that. So I just want to show you the effects of when you become a monthly subscriber what you're getting in return for, for your money, not only are you getting benefits, you're also getting better content. And I got this, uh, I saw this article in the Sunday Times by Nicholas Kristof, who is a Times uh, columnist, and it's called How to Win a War on Drugs. And it is basically about Portugal. And libertarians have always talked about Portugal and how it changed everything when they legalized drugs. And it did, and Nicholas Kristof, because of the opioid crisis, went to uh, Portugal to find out. So I just want to read you some sections of this, and then we'll go to Harry to give a little color commentary. Uh, but I th Because I think it's really interesting, and it's something that as the opioid crisis becomes a serious discussion here in America, we need, we need facts. And uh, I would r highly recommend going and reading this entire piece. So this is Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times on September 22nd, 2017. Decades, decades ago, the United States and Portugal both struggled with illicit drugs and took decisive action in diametrically opposite directions. The U.S. cracked down vigorously, spending billions of dollars incarcerating drug users. In contrast, Portugal undertook a monumental experiment. It decriminalized the use of all drugs in 2001. Even heroin and cocaine and, un, un, and unleashed a major public... Okay. It decriminalized the use of all drugs in 2001, even heroin and cocaine, and unleashed a major public health campaign to tackle addiction. Ever since in Portugal, drug addiction has been treated more as a medical challenge than as a criminal justice issue. After more than 15 years, it's clear which approach to work better. The United States drug policy failed spectacularly, with about as many as Americans dying last year of overdoses. And I, wanna, I want to underline this because this was an amazing fact that I didn't know with about as many and Iraq wars combined in contrast Portugal may be winning the war on drugs by ending it today the health ministry estimates that only about 25,000 Portuguese use heroin down from 100,000 when the policy began the number of Portuguese dying from overdoses plunged more than 85% before rising a bit in the aftermath of the European economic crisis of recent years. Even so, Portugal's drug mortality rate is the lowest in Western Europe, one-tenth the rate of Britain or Denmark, and about one-fiftieth the latest number for the U.S. It's not a miracle or a perfect solution, but if the U.S. could achieve Portugal's death rate from we could save one life every 10 minutes. We would save almost as many lives as are now lost to guns and car accidents combined if we decriminalized all drugs in the way that Portugal did it, Harry. Oh, well. If you use the left as, uh, you know, crappy facts on guns, that's a lot, but you have done <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, so they switched. Go ahead. 
I was just going to say, yeah, and it's a, it's a brilliant thing that's happening out there in Portugal, and it's been happening for so long, and it's that experiment that's happening that every libertarian has been citing since what I think it was like, I think the first time I heard it was about 2004, everyone, and that's the one thing everyone keep, keep bringing up, but leftists keep bringing about, but it, and it's just a really cool situation that's happening. Though. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the policy that they, they did with it. Portugal switched to its health focus under the leadership of a socialist prime minister named Antonio Gutierrez. And if the name sounds familiar, it's because he's now the UN Secretary mm -hmm. General. The new approach was a gamble. We were teaching a devastating situ we were facing a devastating situation, so we had nothing to lose. Uh, <laughs> recalled Jaal Castel Braco Gualo. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> a, pu a public health expert. It's, I'm not like uh, Joe Biden, you know, uh, Manawa Nawalia. Uh, a public health expert and the architect of the policy, our national hero, as one Portuguese cabinet minister told him. So let's be clear on what Portugal did and didn't do. First, it didn't change laws on drug trafficking. Dealers still go to prison. And it didn't quite legalize drug use, but rather made the purchase or possession of small quantities up to a 10-day supply not a crime, but an administrative offense, like a traffic ticket. Offenders are summoned to a dissuasion commission hearing, an informal meeting at a conference table with social workers who try to prevent a casual user from becoming an addict. So in the first year or so of decriminalization in Portugal, there seemed to be the increase in drug use that critics had predicted. But although the Portuguese model is often described simply as decriminalization, perhaps the more important part as a public health initiative to treat, to treat addiction and discourage narcotics use. My take is that decriminalization on its own might have led to a modest increase in the use of hard drugs, but that it is swamped by public health efforts that led to an overall decline. Almost done here. On balance, the evidence is that drug use stabilized or declined since Portugal changed advanced approaches, particularly for heroin. In polls, the proportion of 15 to 24-year-olds who say that they have used illicit drugs in the last month dropped by almost half since decriminalization. Oh, wow. So half, as many 15 to 24-year-olds are using drugs as especially heroin in the last month than did before the, legaliza the legalization, the decriminalization, not the legalization, but... Decrim also made it easier to fight infectious diseases and treat overdoses. In the U.S., people are sometimes reluctant to call 911 after a friend overdoses for fear of an arrest. That's not a risk in Portugal. In 99, Portugal had the highest rate of drug-related AIDS in the EU. Since then, HIV diagnoses have attributed to injections have fallen by more than 90%, and Portugal is no longer at the high end. One attraction of the Portuguese approach is that it's incomparably cheaper to treat people than to jail them. The health minister... Meanwhile, the U.S. has spent some $10,000 per household, more than $1 trillion, over the decades on a failed drug policy that results in more than 1,000 deaths each week and climbing. So... I think that is just really clear evidence. I think it was a great article. You should share it with your friends. You should share that on Facebook. It's by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times called How to Win a War on Drugs. And uh, the, the numbers in there, you know, I, I went through and selected uh, portions of it, but has a lot of uh, other facts and figures in there that mm -hmm. I think are really important. And it just goes to show those numbers are just, it, it, well, that would never work in America. Why? I don't agree with you. Correct, yeah. And the places inside of America that's decrimmed on certain drugs has, has helped out lots of different crises because a lot of people get on these opi op opioid addictions because of, the, one, they self-medicate. They do it because they get hooked on certain drugs as either as children, like if they were on Adderall or uh, some of these other like ADHD medication, get cut off at 18, 19, then they still want that high and they still chase that. Or they get put on pain, on pain medications and like here in Indiana, they're cutting off your supply to pain meds here, uh, what you can get at CVS, which is, which is it's nuts because if anything happens to the supply, you're, sh you're stuck with this very short supply and you have to keep coming back out like an addict each time to CVS every like week to get your, your payments because you have legitimate pain. It's ridiculous and you could have something else. The other thing it is, it's cool because it took out a lot of the um, 
like the risk factor out of it. So the risk factor of getting one, like making it highly legal, like sense of that, so it will lower the price. Right. And you know the whole well, if we make it uncool too, but whatever. I always hated that argument. <laughs> right. It's like we made it uncool. I'm like, well, there never was cool. <laughs> nothing, nothing is cooler than a meth head. Yeah, yeah, no teeth. That's so cool. But, uh, <laughs> but the uh, what was it going like? But the whole argument on, uh, but it was mostly just more people just wanting to self medicate themselves and to get past and over different things. So like, if there's a lot of people who uh, I'm most. I don't barely. I don't know anyone that does a lot, a lot of these harder drugs, but when well, James Neese, but other than, <clears> other than him, uh, when you look at it, a lot of them, just self medicate because they have like a pain or they have some sort of anxiety, and that helps them get past it because they don't have access to anything else. Right. And the biggest violence from it is for the simple fact that you know the cops kicks people doors in. Right. You know, and they they threaten. They pull that. They pull a supply off the street, so that creep, you know makes it the price goes up. So it more incentivized for like criminal gangs to get inside there and do it. But if it's it, if you don't know, really threatened about it, and the people are just walking around with maybe a thigh, as long as they have a small supply of it, okay. It takes right. a lot, you know, it takes a lot of this like, crap out of it. The police aren't hunting down, like, they're looking for drug arrest. They're mostly just trying to look out and make sure everyone's okay. Right. It's not, it's not, is Portugal a perfect, like, like, city on the hill? Heck no. It's got its problems. It's still got its problems. They're, they're still, but they still have drug use. Yeah. And you're not ever going to get rid of drug use, but you're not going to have the amount of deaths. Yeah. And the, the amount of public cost. Yeah. You Same know. thing with, like, with alcohol. The most dangerous drug in the whole world, alcohol. You know, once that was uh, decriminalized, legalized here in the United States, basically, uh, like, we still have, like, people overdosing on alcohol. We still have, it's, to what? To most Americans, it's a rite of passage to take someone who turns 21 years of age in this country to force them to overdose on alcohol and have 21 doses of, of drink, right? So they are waking up the next day hungover and puking themselves up. Right. All right, let's move on to the next topic, uh, which is Trump's new travel ban. Uh, so you probably didn't hear about his new travel ban against uh, several countries as he reintroduced his travel ban, which the Supreme Court dropped uh, the travel ban case because of this new travel ban. Uh, and that happened on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Sunday he Sunday afternoon, yeah, Donald, Trump, Donald Trump put this out. So let's see what happens on Sunday. Oh, yeah, football games. What was going on the, on Sunday? Oh, yeah, f- we were talking about kneeling at football games. And not the travel ban. So Friday, the health care law went down in flames. What happened on Friday? Trump tweeted and uh, pr- <laughs> appeared at a rally criticizing football, knowing he was going to do the, the travel ban on Sunday. So mm-hmm. he's a wily old fox, that one. So he put together a new travel ban, and this is in the New York Times. This is from today around the world in the U.S. New travel ban draws anger, applause, and shrugs. And the last travel ban, the first one that went into effect in January that caught so much heat, ended up going to the Supreme Court, but they canceled the hearing of the uh, travel ban standing because obviously the new one has gone into effect. And a White House official has said the new policy was more narrowly targeting, narrowly targeted than its per- precursor, which was swiftly blocked by the courts. But immigrant and diaspora communities from the affected countries – once again reacted with dismay, and refugee advocates denounced the new decree as more of the same. The first travel ban was blocked by federal judges because it was perceived to discriminate against Muslims. The Trump administration argued it was a security measure designed to thwart terrorism. A revised version of that ban expired on Sunday. The new third version, which is to take effect on October 18th, adds Chad, North Korea, and Venezuela to the list of affected countries. Mm-hmm. And drop Sudan. The other effective countries, affected countries are Iran, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and Somalia. Now, all right, so Iran, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, North Korea, Venezuela. Now, with the exception of Venezuela, those are um, Muslim countries. North Korea, obviously, we have uh, issues with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as in Trump is threatening to blow them off the face of the earth. Venezuela has a lot of problems. A lot of people are trying to emigrate here uh, and leave that country. 
The curious one on this list is Chad. So you you drop Sudan and you add Chad. Now, why is Chad? Chad is not a country that many of you probably even are aware of. Now, it's in Central Africa, mm -hmm. and it is directly south of Libya in the middle of Central Africa. But the thing about Chad is the Chad government and the Chad people, Chads, are <laughs> hanging Chads. <laughs> the hanging Chads. Uh, when you're just chilling with your bro from Chad, you're mm -hmm. hanging with Chad. You're hanging Chads. Uh, it's a mixed population of Muslims and Christians, and Chad has been a longtime ally in fighting Islamic militants in the region, including offshoots of al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and its troops took part in a French-led effort to root out Islamist militants in parts of Mali in 2013. And remember the Mali bombings. In a report on Chad last year, the State Department said that few Chadians – Chadians, okay, they're Chadians, mm -hmm. join terrorist groups. So few of the people in that country join terrorist groups, and that country had tightened its borders to impede movements of mil militants, but that a financial crisis kept the country from consistently paying police and military salaries, which presented some risk. So the majority of the rest of this article is just people from various ethnic groups in those countries bitching about the fact that there's a travel ban. Yeah. And you can go and read their stories if you'd like uh, on this article from the New York Times. But I just wanted to bring to your attention the fact that Chad was added. When Chad is a country that is not an Islamic, it's not Iran, yeah. you know, it's not uh, Palestine, it's not exporting terrorists, you're going to get probably more uh, terrorists from Chechnya in Russia or – Saudi Arabia or Iraq than you would from Chad. Yeah. So really sort of a weird thing that the, the president did there. Yeah. All right, so on to the next story. Rand Paul's do-or-die health care demands on Axios.com. Axios, .com. Axios uh, Mike Allen left Politico. He's one of the most influential reporters in the country and started Axios. It's a very good political site, A-X-I-O-S. And uh, he has some health care demands. And – on Friday, Graham Cassidy went down in flames, and that's what we talked about last week, mm -hmm. when Senator Collins, Rand Paul, John McCain, and uh, I don't know if Murkowski said anything yet uh, from Alaska, but all said that they would be voting against the block grant Graham Cassidy uh, health care bill. There was a debate on CNN last night between uh, Bernie Sanders, the uh, senator from uh, Min Minnesota that I forget her name, I apologize, uh, Graham and Cassidy, and it was basically like, well, we want more government. We want socialized health care. And then they're like, well, we want socialized health care too, but just not as big, and we want to fund it different. I mean there was no real like diversity of thought mm -hmm. in that debate last night, and this is a, a debate that we're going to continue to have, uh, which the wisdom of it, I don't know. I mean is, is this something that we want to spend the next three years arguing over health care? Uh, we'll see, but – we may not have a choice, but Rand Paul came out on Friday when he announced that he – or was it Monday? I don't know what day that he said he – I think it was Monday. I'm getting my days all confused. Uh, but he, he basically came out and said that he's told the president and, and his fellow Republicans that he's got four demands that he think could, could help fix health care without spending a trillion dollars and adding it to the deficit. Uh, number one, cut the Affordable Care Act spending way back. He says the only significant reassessment of this trillion-dollar spending regime would get my support. The problem with this demand is that if you have deep cuts in health care spending – this is Axios' words – you will push away other moderate Republicans and not just Collins and Alaska's Murkowski. So that's the political problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Rand Paul wants to cut Obamacare spending way back. Second is scrap way more Affordable Care Act regulations. He says the problem that states should – have. He says that states should have to opt into ACA regulations than rather having to opt out. So right now the Obamacare regulations stand, and instead he's saying states should be allowed to opt into the pieces that they want to work with. Uh, the political issues with this, they demand that it is that it is only appeals to conservatives. You'd get Ted Cruz on board but still other lose other moderate Republicans. Ted Cruz also said that he was not voting for Graham Cassidy. Number three, expand association health plans, which would let small businesses and individuals band together to buy health insurance. They, they write, the problem with this demand is that Republican leaders have already determined they can't do this through budget reconciliation rules. So 
uh, expand health association plans, which are like spending clubs. So there's a lot of Christian organizations that it, you donate monthly into this uh, pool. If you actually get sick and the money is used for your medical expenses and then things like little doctor's visits or you, you're paying out of pocket and you have access to opted out doctors who make home visits in a lot of cases. Yeah. So yeah, if you're a healthy person and don't smoke, don't do drugs, it's a great program. Yeah. I did it for the longest time. I got out of it because I wanted to go back to smoking cigars. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, the, the not in this list is also allowing people to buy insurance across state lines, which he has also uh, said he told the president that he wanted. So a little bit of what Rand Paul is up to and what his demands are, you can obviously go and uh, – I'm sure Rand Paul has a website or something. Yeah, something like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, Clayton will be able to show his Rand boner right to the website. <laughs> uh, all right. So in in Alabama, we've got a Senate race that will be decided. The polls, it is 8.05 here in Indianapolis on Eastern Time. And the polls just closed about mm-hmm. seven minutes ago in Alabama. And uh, the Ayatollah of Alabama, Roy Moore, who has been kicked off of the bench in uh, Alabama twice. Roy Moore is uh, seems to be like a really uh, grade A nut job. He's running for Senate against Senator Luther Strange, who has uh, been who was the appointed replacement for Jeff Sessions. Luther Strange is uh, like this just tall tall guy that's uh, that Donald Trump is supporting. Now, the reason this is important and the reason we we never really bring up some of these, you know, like little races that are off races. Mm -hmm. But I think this was this one is important. Now, everybody is talking about this race because Donald Trump went down there to support Luther Strange. Steve Bannon is down there to support Roy Moore. And uh, Roy Moore is one of and so they're painting Luther Strange as the Tea Party, as the establishment candidate, while Roy Moore is the Tea Party candidate. And uh, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know about, uh, you know, Luther too much. But I do know that Roy Moore seems like a really uh, – he's a wild person. He, yeah. he, he put a loaded pistol up on, on stage. <laughs> he, he rode in full cowboy out, uh, regalia to vote today on his horse. Trying to get that Tad Western, the Tad Ike vote. It is. It's like Tad Western is running for Senate <laughs> in Alabama. Uh, and so the the race, Mitch McConnell is spending $10 million in advertising for Luther Strange. And uh, Steve Bannon is down there decrying that, saying, Alabama, Alabamians, you shouldn't be bought. Mm-hmm. You, all these outside influences coming in, uh, sh- these, they're a problem. So this is from CNN today. Steve Bannon and Nigel Farage say more can save Trump. And essentially the way that his allies like Nigel Farage and Sarah Palin and Steve Bannon are – as they're down stumping for Roy Moore, mm-hmm. they're saying we're not here to oppose Donald Trump. We're here to remind him and save his soul and remind him of who he truly is and don't get in with the swamp, support people like Roy Moore next year. And uh, let's see. So already Bannon is backing Danny Tarkanian, and so this is in other races, okay? So there's going to be a showdown between Steve Bannon and Donald Trump in various other races. But this is why I think that this race is important. It's not a matter of where the electorate is going. It's a matter of where the Republican Party is going to go in in races next year. Already Bannon is backing Danny Canyon over Senator Dean Heller in Nevada and Kelly Ward over Senator Jeff Flake in Arizona. Republican primaries and the 10 Democratic-held Senate seats in states Trump won – that are on the ballot in 2018 could see similar brawls. It's part of why the McConnell-aligned Senate Leadership Fund has spent $10 million in the primary to boost Strange and tear down Moore. The other part of the McConnell camp's calculus, Moore, who was twice ousted as Supreme Court Chief Justice, once for refusing to remove a Ten Commandments monument, then for ignoring U.S. Supreme Court same-sex marriage ruling, campaigns on installing Christianity at the center of American public life, and rejecting LGBT rights. His long history of controversial remarks would be a fundraising boon for Democrats and would lead to uncomfortable questions for Republican senators about whether they agree or disagree with their new colleague. And so you go back to Todd Akin, you go back to um, 
Richard Mordock, mm -hmm. you know, where life, you know, rape is God's plan is what <laughs> Richard, Richard Mordock. But I'll tell you, I know Richard Mordock, and uh, Richard Mordock was – like he was a very decent man. He he asked if he could come speak to the local libertarians because he wanted to get to know what we what we thought when he was the state treasurer. He he wasn't a uh, a crazy person like he was portrayed to yeah. be, but uh, Roy Moore <laughs> is portraying himself as a crazy person. Uh, so essentially, what what this is showing is that McConnell is trying to get. Um, this more fellow feed it defeated because if strange wins then that shows that he has fundraising prowess and it demoralizes and demotivates the other tea party backed candidates in those other races because they've got they could have 10 potential pickups because there's 10 democratic held seats in trump won states mm -hmm. up for election next year so they don't want as as the establishment in the republican party to have a lot of challenges in these Senate seats. The other part of it is he becomes a lightning rod, and then he says and does all this crazy shit. The media focuses on it, and then every person, like here in Indiana, we've got a, a race for Joe Donnelly. Uh, that's one of the ten. Joe Donnelly yeah. is a moderate Democrat, somebody who's very likable. A lot of people in Indiana do like uh, him because he's not a, a raving liberal, and he's mm -hmm. uh, great with constituent services. And then he's facing against Luke Messer or Todd Rakita, presumably, and two Republicans who are Congress people, and uh, lifelong elected Republicans, party insiders. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, bo 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 yeah, bo it's... both sides. So they don't want a, uh, a a winnable race like a Luke Messer or Rakita over or... Joe Donnelly mm -hmm. to be spoiled by Roy Moore. Or any of these shenanigans. So Correct. this – now here's Super the – predictable. Right. Now, as of the polls – as of today, the polling showed that Luther Strange was about 10 to 15 points down. So <laughs> so we will see. Uh, I, I expect Roy Moore to win. They call him the Ayatollah of Alabama, and uh, it will be – now, if Luther Strange wins, it's game over. They pick up that seat. If Roy Moore wins, then they've got to spend money to defend a seat that they didn't want to defend as Republicans. So it becomes an actual race in Alabama that they've got to win in November. So very interesting, very weird race down there in Alabama. So uh, if, if you see the results, then that will give you a little context to that. Yeah, something to watch, Yep, especially if you're a political nerd. Now, uh, one other little inside uh, tip, um, Senator Corker, Bob Corker of Tennessee, won't run for re-election next year. According to the Tennessean, Corker says he wants to act thoughtfully and independently for the rest of his term without running re-election and why it matters. Corker is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and was a reliably GOP establishment vote. According to the Tennessean, Corker had agonized about running again in the face of a possible challenge from more conservative Republicans' opponents. He was also a very good friend uh, to Donald Trump early in the campaign and was somebody that was uh, thought to be a front runner for secretary of state. And so that tells me he's either going to take a job in the administration or he's got a mistress. So <laughs> because he's a young, uh, younger guy for a senator, he's young. I mean, he's like in his 60s, but those I mean, oof. All right, on to the next story. Now, this is when we get into some of the meteor topics. Uh, Twitter pledges to update public policies after Trump threatens to uh, go to war with North Korea. <laughs> All right, so, Harry, there's a debate. Should Twitter ban Donald Trump from Twitter? Technically, he hasn't, he hasn't you know, broken any of the terms of service. Harry, he threatened to – he basically declared war as president of the United States – on North Korea on Twitter. That's not cyberbullying. I mean, it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's. This is from TheVerge.com. Twitter didn't act to remove President Donald Trump's tweets threatening North Korea in part because it is newsworthy, said today. There's been a controversy since the 2016 primaries of other whether Twitter should ban Trump's account or hide some of his tweets, which often insult other individuals. <laughs> oh, my feels. Twitter hasn't done anything, but the issue roiled up again today after North Korea said it saw the U.S. president's tweet as a clear declaration of war. 
For a platform that has long claimed its rules apply to all users, no matter who they are, a perceived declaration of war seemed like it might just cross the line. Twitter's answer, however, basically implies that Trump's account will never be censored. Anything from the president's tweets are newsworthy, which means that none of his tweets can be pulled from the platform. That in Twitter needs people to go to Twitter, and which way to do that? Lightning rod is Donald Trump. Dude, Twitter's trying to sell itself. It's, it wants to be sold. It wants to be bought. The easiest way to get people to go on to it, and if you want Trump off it so bad, buy Twitter. Yeah, so Trump is uh, – Trump has saved Twitter. Yeah. I mean yeah, Twitter. Twi- yeah, that too, yeah. Exactly. Twitter right. was dying. It, it was dying. It still is. I mean they're going to 280 characters. Did you read that? No, that yeah. ruins it. Yeah, they're uh, – I don't have – I still have 140, but I begged them. I said I have a libertarian podcast. I'm very verbose. I need 280 characters. Twitter is the best thing to argue. Like this is the only time I will try to argue with um, idiots online with is Twitter because it forces their argument to 140 characters. They can't sit there and do this gigantic wall of text. I don't have time to read your your essay because I will respond with you know one word. I'll just, I'll just go K or meh. <laughs> right. <laughs> because I don't have time to read your essay. Just something quick, quick, fast. Let's let's go. Now, if you listen to last week's episode, we in the bonus episode, in the bonus segment that our, our subscribers heard, that alone was worth the five dollars for this month. I mean, you're getting so much extra content now behind the paywall, it's ridiculous. They're gonna start calling me crazy Chris because I'm just my prices are so low, Harry. You get, a bonus uh, content. You get bonus content. You get bonus content. <laughs> Uh, we, you and I did 56 extra minutes on the Facebook uh, advertising, mm-hmm. s- quote unquote, scandal, and what a bunch of l- bullshit. Now, yep. in, in summation, a uh, hundred thousand dollars was spent by Russians. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that a hundred thousand dollars to get 20 million impressions does not mean that 20 million people were impacted by the content, and a hundred thousand dollars across um, uh, uh, many different channels to many different audiences is absolutely meaningless in the grand scheme of things in terms of Facebook advertising and motivating people to do anything. Uh, $100,000 over 3,000 political ads means those ads did nothing. This is an absolute bullshit scandal. Correct. And the Washington Post uh, put out an article that I thought was really interesting, and we're going to read a lot of this because I just – you should read the whole thing, but it's very long, so I just pulled some of the highlights for our audience here, but it is called Obama tried to give Zuckerberg a wake up call over fake news on Facebook. This is in the Washington Post on Sunday, September 24th, 2017 by mm-hmm. Adam Intus. Uh, now, uh, Greg wanted to weigh in on this story and basically say if nothing else proves the idea of the quote unquote globalists mm-hmm. or the uh, uh, establishment elite left trying to keep Donald Trump out of office, nothing will prove it more than this story. And I think he's totally right, uh, that there was some level of conspiracy at the top levels to keep Donald Trump out of the White House, because you you just keep that in mind as we read the story. So nine days after Facebook chief executive Mark Zuckerberg dismissed as as crazy the idea that fake news on his company's social network played a key role in the U.S. elections, President Barack Obama pulled the youthful tech billionaire aside and delivered what he hoped would be a wake-up call. Now huddled in a private room on the sidelines of meeting of world leaders in Lima, Peru, two months before Trump's inauguration, Obama made a personal appeal to Zuckerberg to take the threat of fake news and political disinformation seriously. Unless Facebook and the government did more to address the threat, Obama warned, it would only get worse in the next presidential race. Zuckerberg acknowledged the problem posed by fake news, but he told Obama those messages weren't widespread on Facebook and that there was no easy fix, according to people briefed on the exchange, who spoke on the condition of anonymity. Still still isn't. It yep. still isn't widespread. It's mm-hmm. 300, 3,000 messages, $100,000. That's nothing. I mean, yep. we're talking... We're talking, and they, they put this number in here, uh, somewhere in here if I find it, but they're like the second largest online advertiser with 250 some billion dollars in revenue, mm-hmm. second only behind Google. I mean, $250 billion, 
Yeah. <laughs> and we're talking about hundred thousand dollars here. Yeah. Think how much like Axe and Old Spice has spent to get teenagers to wear deodorant. And and it ha- it's a drop in the bucket. Mm-hmm. It's so these issues have forced Facebook and other Silicon Valley companies to weigh core values, including freedom of speech, against problems created when malevolent actors use the same freedoms to pump messages of violence, hate libertarianism and disinformation oh wait that wasn't there i'm just kidding uh there has been a rising bipartisan clamor meanwhile for a new regulation of the tech industry amid a historic surge in wealth and power over the past decade that has largely had its way in washington despite concerns raised by critics about its behavior this is a news article in the washington post owned by jeff bezos of amazon raising the question of when are we going to regulate social media Mm -hmm. In particular, momentum is building in Congress and elsewhere. Now, let me clarify that. Amazon, who powers 86% of cloud computing, uh-huh. in in his newspaper, mm-hmm. arguably the second most powerful newspaper in the country, yep. when he's one of the big four in Facebook, Google, uh, Apple, and Amazon – Arguing that maybe there should be some regulation of the other three. Correct. It, it, it's yeah. Amazon is a very scary, gigantic company, and it's on a world domination tour. Yes. In particular, momentum is building in Congress and elsewhere in the federal government for a law requiring tech companies like newspapers and television stations and traditional carriers of campaign messages to disclose who buys political ads and how much money they spend on them. There is no question that the idea that Silicon Valley is the darling of our markets and of our society, that sentiment is definitely turning, said Tim O'Reilly, an advisor to tech executives and chief executive of the influential Silicon Valley-based publisher O'Reilly Media. They then go on to talk about the Islamic State and what Facebook did to fight the Islamic State, which I found to be pretty interesting. But then they get into some of the Russian stuff and – I felt like a lot of this just really kind of doesn't doesn't connect the dots when it comes. This is this is no smoking gun, but it turned out that Facebook, without realizing it, had stumbled into the Russian operation as it was getting underway in June 2016. At the time, cybersecurity experts at the company Facebook were trashing a tracking a Russian hacker known as APT28 or Fancy Bear. Which, honestly, I would like my nickname to be Fancy Bear, Harry. Uh, <laughs> which U.S. intelligence officials considered an arm of the Russian military intelligence service, the GRU, GRU, according to people familiar with Facebook's activity. Uh, these people are best known for stealing military plans and uh, data from political targets. Facebook then went to the FBI and uh, had, with their suspicions, they called the FBI and they said, we think in a Russian espionage operation is happening and uh, FBI spokesperson did not confirm that. Soon thereafter, Facebook cyber experts found evidence that members of APT28 were setting up a series of shadowy accounts, including a persona known as Guccifer 2.0 and a Facebook page called DC Leaks uh, to promote stolen emails and documents during the presidential race. Mm -hmm. Facebook officials once again contacted the FBI to share what they had seen. After the November election, Facebook began to look more broadly at the accounts that had been created during the campaign. Uh, A review by the company found the most of the groups behind the problematic pages had clear financial motives, which suggested they weren't working for a foreign government. Ooh, shocking. But amid the mass of data the company was analyzing, the security team did not find clear evidence of Russian disinformation or ad purchases by the Russian-linked accounts. Nor did any U.S. law enforcement or intelligence officials visit the company to lay out what they knew, said people with familiar with the effort. Uh, (laughs) So let let me rephrase that. Facebook is the one that caught the quote-unquote Russian hackers. Yes. Clearly said the, this is not a foreign government. These are people just trying to get so- social security numbers to steal money. Mm-hmm. But they still contacted the FBI to be good citizens. It wasn't until after Donald Trump won the election that anyone in Washington actually started paying attention to them. <laughs> when it fit the narrative. Exactly right. The sophistication of the Russian tactics caught off guard – Caught Facebook off guard. Its highly regarded security team had erected a formidable defenses against traditional cyber attacks, but failed to anticipate that Facebook users, 
deploying easily available automation tools such as ad micro-targeting, pump skillfully crafted propaganda through social networks without setting any alarm bells, which means they just were really good at buying ads. Yeah. But I buy ads all day long, and I, you know, I had hell one time, the word hell, you know, like – uh, we explained what the hell is happening in our world, mm-hmm. and uh, that got caught by their sensors and didn't get approved. Um, so then they go on to talk about the political postmortem, uh, and one of the theories to emerge from their postmortem, the narrative that the Clinton team cam- uh, created was that Facebook and fake news and all this is the reason she lost. These former advisors didn't have hard evidence that Russian trolls were using Facebook to micro-target voters in swing districts, at least not yet. But they shared their theories with House and Senate Intelligence Committees, which launched parallel investigations into Russia's role in the presidential campaign in January. So uh, these former advisors to the Clinton campaign didn't have any hard evidence that Russian trolls were using Facebook to micro-target micro micro-target yeah. voters in swing districts mm-hmm. where it would actually matter, at least not yet. But they shared their theories with the House and Senate, and their buddies in the House and Senate launched investigations. Yep. And then now we've, we've uh, we found $100,000 in 3,000 ads. Uh, so then they go on, and they did an, an internal examination, and uh, they did a white paper in April – Facebook's chief security officer, Alex Stamos, co-authored a 13-page white paper uh, that you can read, and they link it. Facebook sits at a critical juncture, Stamos wrote. Uh, Actions taken by organized actors, governments, or non-state actors to distort domestic or foreign political sentiment most frequently to achieve a strategic or geopolitical outcome. He described how the company used a technique known as machine learning to build specialized data mining software that can detect – detect patterns of behavior Mm -hmm. for example the repeated posting of the same content malevolent actors might use so basically if your crazy aunt donna goes on there and just posts the same thing to 50 different pages Mm -hmm. facebook looks at that and goes okay this is somebody to watch because they're a spammer or maybe they're isis or maybe they're just annoying the shit out of their family (laughs) right but (laughs) we don't want to show their content we need to get rid of these people um, <clears throat> you know, the, the the Facebook game people that keep invi- – <laughs> The software tool was given a secret desk. Now, this is really important for libertarians and people who are anti-government. You need to pay attention to this. The software tool was given a secret designation, and Facebook is now deploying it and others in the run-up elections around the world. This tool was used in the French election in May. And it was used. It, it was used in the French election, where it helped disable three thirty thousand fake accounts. The company said, "It was test again on Sunday when the Germans went to the polls. Facebook declined to share the software tool's code name. Another recently developed tool shows users when articles have been disputed by third-party fact checkers. Hmm. So they now let's think about this. The Russians in all of 2016 in the American election." Only bought 30,000 ads. Right. 30,000 mm-hmm. accounts were disabled in the French elections. Mm. Suspicious. Odd. It's uh, just, just it's coincidence. coincidence. So the, uh, Mark Warner, who is spearheading this, the senator from Virginia is spearheading this in, uh, in, in the Senate. And he flew out to California and uh, basically – asked if Russians had used the company tools to disseminate anti-Clinton ads to key districts. Officials said that Stamos underlined to Warner the magnitude of the challenge Facebook faced policing political content that looked legitimate. Stamos told Warner that Facebook had found no accounts that used advertising but agreed with the senator that some likely existed. The difficulty for Facebook was finding them. Finally, uh, finally Stamos appealed to Warner for help. If the U.S. intelligence agencies had any information about the Russian operation or the troll farms it used to disseminate misinformation, they should share it with Facebook. The company is still waiting. And they'll keep waiting. Yeah. Technicians did find stuff because they searched for indicators that would link those ads to Russia. They searched it in Russian entity known as the Internet Research Agency, which had been publicly identified as a troll farm, so they used public reports. 
mm -hmm. to go back and find if this group, the Internet Research Agency, had bought ads, and they had. And uh, by early August, Facebook had identified more than 3,000 ads addressing social and political issues that ran in the U.S. between 2015 and 2017, a period of 2,000 years, and that appeared to have come from accounts associated with the Internet Research Agency. So we are uh, – we have political operatives and Democratic senators who lost an election and are butthurt about that election, mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. created a narrative that Russians created enough fake news to sway the election, and they are now trying to manufacture enough evidence to make that true. Mm -hmm. And using 3,000 Facebook ads over two years – at the grand total of $100,000 mm -hmm. as the linchpin, the smoking gun of, the, of Hillary losing the election. You know, instead of the truth. <laughs> right, <laughs> which is Hillary's a piece of shit and nobody liked her. Right. <laughs> right. So now, that being said, we do want to uh, – do you have anything that you want to add to that before we move on to the, to the Germans? No, no. All right. We can go to the Germans. All right. So the Germans just had an election, and uh, far right – Essentially, uh, you'll hear Nazis were elected in uh, in Germany, and the, the Christian Democratic Union and Angela Angela Merkel won. She's the it's her fourth term. She's on on pace to basically become the longest serving chancellor since um, since uh, 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 what's the Bismarck. Um, and, and so we want to just explain a little bit to you because you're going to hear a lot about these right-wing Nazis in Germany, and I want you to have an understanding of what they believe and who they are. I don't agree with them, and I don't think they're good guys, but I think that you should have an understanding of them nonetheless. So the CDU uh, is doing a fifth tour at 36% one. Uh, there's a general German preference for political stability, someone from the Brookings Institute said. This is an article on Vox, The German Elections Explained by Sarah Wildman on September 22nd. Uh, that is reinforced by the creeping instability of Germany's situation in the middle of Europe, the crisis in the Middle East and Africa, Russian aggression, a transatlantic relationship that is suddenly fraught, and Eastern European neighbors who are flirting with authoritarianism. Germany is also the bank of the Euro European Union. They are the ones who have kept everyone afloat through the Euro crisis. In other words, the world is a scary place. Muddy, mommy, as Merkel is sometimes called in Germany, is a comforting hand on the tiller. Uh, now, Alternative for Germany got 12% of the boat, vote. The AFD is a new party. Uh, and uh, I won't get into Merkel too much, but um, she's, they go on to talk a little bit about Merkel. She was in, grew up in East Germany, and uh, that really shaped her because she's a German who grew up in, under communism. And uh, she, she's taken a stance for refugees, adding about a million refugees in Germany. Uh, she's usually very careful, very politically slow, very thoughtful, but she took a risk with this because uh, they think because of her time growing up in Eastern Europe. And she basically said once, I lived a long time behind a fence. It's not something I wish to do when Hungary uh, said, Fill, build a physical barrier to keep out refugees. Um, one of the risks was the refugee crisis, and it nearly cost her this last term. Merkel's somewhat uncharacter uncharacteristically decisive active eh, in the heat of the 2015 migrant crisis may have stemmed from her eastern Germany years, and uh, she opened for refugees from Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East, swamped Mediterranean ports and European train stations, images of men, women, and children clamoring for a better life in Europe, and some dying in pursuit of freedom shocked the world. Nearly about 900,000 refugees arrived in Germany by the year's end. Not everybody was happy about it. <laughs> uh, now, the AFD was founded in 2013 by a handful of economists, academics, and former members basically to oppose uh, the euro and to pull Germany out of the euro. Saying, why are we paying for Greeks, Greece's mistakes? Like, why are we paying and backing all of these bums? Mm -hmm. And then all these uh, right-wing extremists came in started to come in and, and change it from economics to the social issues. It sounds like the Republican Party, honestly. Oh, yeah. um, 
Some AFD members also began to dabble in a different sort of uncomfortable nationalism, one that questioned the post-war German culture of memorialization. In Germany, since the Holocaust, memorials have been erected across the country. The AFD began to bemoan the country's inability to celebrate the past. One of the party's new leaders, Alexander Gulland, told a party rally earlier this month that his countrymen should have the right to be proud of the achievements of German soldiers in two world wars. These are calculated breaches of taboo, uh, said this dude in Germany. These are provocations. They are designed to sort of propel the AFD time and again into the media and into the public debate. So they say shocking and outrageous things to get noticed. And that's exactly what Donald Trump has done. And they are huge on Facebook. And they won 12 percent because of Facebook, because of shocking statements. Uh, the Washington Post did an examination analysis, Germany's far-right party AFD won the Facebook battle by a lot. And since January, AFD's Facebook post averaged around 3,500 likes per post, almost doubled the nearest rival, the CSU, the ruling power, which received 1,900 on average. In addition, a AFD consistently got more likes per post than any other party. How'd they do this? By sharing a high volume of highly sensi and sensational tweets and posts, which other social media users reacted to emotionally. For example, shortly after the terror attacks in Barcelona Matt, last month, the AFD posted a picture of a bloody tire marks with the headline, Mrs. Merkel, the victim of your political rampage, are not forgotten, but how many have to die before you understand? It published two similar posts with different headlines, both implying that the terror attacks are a direct consequence of Angela Merkel's refugee policies. These posts received 6,800 likes from Facebook users. The response by the Social Democrats, the SDP, the second party, 973. 7,000 to 900. Uh, so it, they're, they're shit posting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. And they're getting org organically shared and liked around because people. Some people just like to watch people react to shit posters. Right. You know, when they've never seen it before, like, oh, this is this. You've seen this crap. You know, right. I can't believe this. And just the hate. I can't believe this. These people are awful. See this. Yeah. So it is. It is. It's just shit posting to get attention. And I can tell you that this weekend on Facebook, if I post stuff about the NFL, mm -hmm. it blows up. I mean, it's just it's like 30,000 impressions versus the normal. If I post an article, it's. Mm -hmm. 2000 I mean it's because people want to get in there and they want to they want to yell at us mm -hmm. for having a perceived side yep. every post every rhetorical question is a Rorschach test mm -hmm. you know I posted just the question because I did this I was using it without having read this article I was using this tactic because yep. I want people to think do current soldiers mm -hmm. fight for our freedoms mm -hmm. because I think that is a fundamental question of this debate is do you think a person serving in Iraq and Afghanistan right now are, ser are, are protecting our freedom as a country? Mm -hmm. That's, I, I wasn't trying to lead anybody in any direction other than to get them to think about the question, answer, and have a dialogue. And, man, I was, take, I was on Colin Kaepernick's side. I was on Donald Trump's side for posting that. Uh, I was, an, I was uh, trying to kill babies. I mm -hmm. was trying to kill soldiers. I mean, it was... It's just amazing what people project onto just a simple, non-rhetorical question, yep. you know. And so, if, but if you use controversy, you can get attention, and if you get attention, you can get 12 percent of the vote in in uh, in Germany. And let's be honest, first time around, the Nazis got six. I think it was. <laughs> so, so yeah, something to they they are. Um, I don't know if they're Nazis, but they're, they definitely in Germany resemble the American uh, Trumpian, like a lot of this. Uh, Trumpsonian. If, Harry, tell me if I'm wrong. If Tom Brady were to kneel during the national anthem under the social justice, do you think that Donald Trump would give a shit? Do you think Donald Trump would say anything, or is it the fact that a black man is kneeling? You know what? It's... <sighs> I would like to hopefully you, – you like to give the best out that, no, he would still be offended because of what's happening and he, the perceived slight. But, of course, the other thing, I don't think he perceives any slight that Kaepernick is kneeling. I think he's just a political tool. Yeah, exactly. Okay. He doesn't care. That's a very good distinction. I don't think our aunt on Facebook mm – -hmm. I think our aunt on Facebook, our boomer yeah, friends so, that yeah. we see mm -hmm. bitching about this stuff, 
fly a lot of N words when they see Michael Bennett or uh, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. Yeah. And Donald Trump knows that, and so he's on their side and speaking for them. Mm-hmm. It's those people that become political tools for Donald Trump. Yeah. I well, don't think those people would give a shit. They'd probably support Tom Brady mm-hmm. because he's white, a good portion of them. I'm not saying all of them, but possibly, a good portion. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's the other thing. That's a little weird debate when you hit your, when you left the NFL and went to the NASCAR side. Yeah. Watch Richard Petty and all of them go that, and then watch Dale Jr., right? Go – you know what? No, if you want to do it, that's okay. I, you know, and just that that middle of the road, like you know what? You know, you're an American. Do what you want. You know, right. And the other thing I always got with it, which is that if standing up and saying um, to the pledge and sit there, or just doing for the anthem, right, and standing over your head to the uh, allegiance uh, to, to, stoop, to the super piece of cloth, that made you an American. There's a whole country south of uh, the United States that would do that. There's a lot of people that would do that just to come here. There's a lot of people in other countries that's like, if all I have to do is stand for, you know, your anthem, dude, I'll be here in a heartbeat. Yeah. You know, if that makes you patriotic and an American, that's that's it. That is the that is the line. Then if that's your citizenship test, then there is no illegals. Right. And and I would bet that a lot of these people are getting beers during the national anthem, or mm-hmm. you know, not getting, all of them are yeah, you know getting beer. Or they not... become super patriots when it's the black guy protesting. Yeah, is <laughs> really right. how I feel about it. Or they just know like the one verse of the of the national anthem, or yeah. or like okay, have you ever gone to like, what is it? Yeah, gone off to Fort Sumter and like and you know they talk about mm-hmm. you know the revolution and you watch and that's the Civil the Cur- War. Yeah, the Civil War and you watch. And even if you can watch the flag go, like, open up the flag and have everyone, like, talk about, you know, start talking about the national anthem, stuff like that. And to watch the crowd and how long it takes everyone to start standing and start saying the pledge. Yeah. No, I mean. It's kind of cool to watch you sit in the background and watch I, it all happen. I, I love America, and I love our founding, and I love the principles that we, um, that we, that we stand for. I tear up at the at the uh, Star Spangled Banner every single race day. Do you in in May? Yeah, I'm uh, as you live as you anarcho capitalists call me a flagget. Uh, <laughs> I you know, and I I'm a libertarian because I believe that the, the the founding generation that was a very particular epoch in history when mm-hmm. humans mankind stood up and said we don't need a government to rule us. Mm-hmm. Here's a potential framework for us to rule ourselves and that if you study world history the history of human beings is a very powerful moment in history and that's what the flag means to me it's it's like war is not uh the end all be all of the flag to me and what makes me uh, what makes me angry is that war for so many conservatives mm-hmm. and the achievements of war and the loss in war is really what the flag means to those people. And I don't get that, and I just don't support that, and I'm not going to. I support our soldiers, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to support, you know, bad government policy like Mm -hmm. Vietnam or Korea. Correct, yeah. Because it it got, like, also that's the other part of the debate. It got very death culty. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's yeah. just like we're a country of necromancers. Like you have to res- – these dead bodies in the ground, you have to respect them. I was right. Like, we're going to dig them up too and right. have them march them out on the 4th of July par- parade. But your flag's a spook. Your 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 song's a spook. Oh, well, you can use that term, and I can't. So I don't feel that well, this is an equitable country. I'm going to kneel now. All right, final story. This one's going to run a little long because we had ten subjects, and so we really felt we needed to get to you. And I've got one more comment at the end that's real brief. We want to cover Equifax because there's a lot of stuff going on with Equifax. And uh, it took – so this is from Vox again. Vox, they're liberal, and you have to read Vox with the – knowing that it is a liberal site, and they're always going to side with more of the liberal side. Uh, I I read mainstream news, and I just know that it's all going to – like I like Erin Burnett on CNN. I used Mm -hmm. to. I've always liked Erin Burnett. But she's gone so far off the deep end and bought into whatever the narrative of the day is that she's lost the ability to think critically. And so I think, you know, Vox, you go into it knowing that they're a liberal site, so you have to be aware of what you're getting. But they do a really good job of explaining a lot of things, and uh, they have these explainers that are really good too. Uh, Equifax hacks are a case study in why we need better data breach laws. So Vox is arguing for more laws. So, but I think 
it's really important for libertarians to hear the new laws that are going to start being floated around Equifax. So Equifax, just a few of the the, the particulars, and I know Harry's Harry's full. He's ready to screech like you wouldn't believe. He's ready to join me in boomer genocide. <laughs> It took six weeks after credit reporting agency Equifax found out that it had been hacked for the company to notify 143 million, million customers whose private data was at risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 143, uh, it took six weeks after the data breach. Took time this year. Not the biggest. You know, like Yahoo affected 500 million accounts, but that's your Yahoo account. You haven't opened that one since, you know, 2006. Uh, when you got your Gmail and you're like, I don't, don't, don't write me at Chris underscore Yahoo, okay? <laughs> not going to work anymore. Uh, it's the value of the data stolen. Still unknown hackers gained access to a trove of names, birth dates, social security numbers, and addresses of Equifax users. With so much personal information, criminals could easily apply, apply for fraudulent loans, open bank accounts or credit cards, and make scams feel more convincing. Like, if you've ever pulled your credit report, and you should, like, I didn't know that I had several accounts open. I didn't know I had forgotten yeah. all the phone numbers I'd ever had. Like all the addresses I lived at, it's a lot of data. It's worse. No, no, no. It's not only like it's your social security number, your it's your driver's license number, it's past addresses. So all those ad, all those questions they would ask you for loan applications to prove that it is you. So any address you've been in the last seven to ten years, your bankruptcy, anything you've ever opened, even if some people things that have applied for you, they can make a fake copy of you very, very quickly with this like with this information. Right. And if you haven't got your credit report you need to do it right now you need to get from all three credit agencies mm-hmm. just to have that on file on paper and just hold on to it and you need to monitor it every year because it's it's more of a, a waiting game of when your credit is going to you know your identity is going to get stolen now yeah it's so a, it's a waiting game now so like equifax started in the late 1800s i think it was where like they just went around to store owners and they said who who pays their bill who pays their shopping bill mm-hmm. and started keeping that record and it's morphed over time and then it became three agencies and then the fair credit report because essentially what was happening is there was all this secret data that was being compiled by these credit reporting mm-hmm. agencies to the point that the FBI under Hoover was starting to go in and ask for the files and demand the files and get it and so finally Congress I think it was in the 60s said we need the free the fair credit reporting act and so uh consumers can go and look at their credit report they can see what everybody else is seeing they can see what uh they can file uh you, you can file and say hey this is a fraudulent thing you can you can mm-hmm. amend your report essentially yeah but and then eventually it only became three companies and so now these three companies have a tremendous amount of power and data mm-hmm and they use a lot of old like t- pieces of technology. They use a lot of old like uh, th- like th- what they would use to identify with different people. The other thing is that you don't opt into the service. You know, you have no choice. If right. You're, if you are inside the United States in Canada, you know, you're, you're you're using their service. You have a social security number. You're in the service. Correct. Yeah. If you apply for a job, you got a you know you cell phone bill. You inquired about credit for a credit card. You know, because you wanted to you know buy those really cool Jinko pants back in the '90s. You know. Right. <laughs> well, and the scary part is that some of these services and Equifax was leading the way, uh, incorporating your social presence. And so companies and and they were starting to get into HR. Yeah. So if you're a hiring agency, you can see you know their credit score, which mm-hmm. a lot of uh, companies will do. If you're handling money, they want to see that you're you're not you know in debt for nine million dollars, mm-hmm. and you're going to steal twenties out of the register. But they're also starting to incorporate social so you can go and see well this person's a libertarian i don't want to hire them yeah. you know they don't try, they don't kneel when the flag comes about i don't want to hire them you know so it that to me is once you start to have there are things in other countries called social credit yeah and in other countries employers lenders they can all go look at your social credit score and if you aren't a good patriot then your social credit score gets dinged uh, it's and that's a frightening thing for uh, anybody who loves freedom is that yeah it's not a government program but it's still really shitty and, and anti free speech yeah because yeah, the hacker news reported like uh, the massive Equifax has hit 143 million different people right the other thing is with it it's fr- it, the the uh, this this one attack this this one this one they were talking about it just came from an old uh, patchy uh, vulnerability that has been patched. And Equifax didn't. Oh. But this breach here is not the only breach that Equifax has had mm. this year. Right. They've had two others. 
They just, you know, but they disclosed them very quietly. The mainstream media has allowed, you know, Equifax and possibly the other uh, freaking uh, like credit agencies to just, you know, get by with these like these breaches. Right. Which is it's but they go after Yahoo or Sony and other thing. But this is a, these are different types of breaches. This is, isn't like a credit card number that you can just go cancel. This is basically every stupid piece of information people use to identify for yourself and it's old crap out of identification if you if you don't have your uh like all your numbers memorized and you call into the bank mm -hmm. what they will do is they will walk you through a series of questions and like if you're in the mid 60s like i know somebody who's in their mid 60s had this happen they didn't know their information so they walked they went to the bank and they walked through their credit report mm -hmm. basically asking like did you live on the street the street that they mentioned he had lived on for like two months in 1974, yep. and it, it and he was just he had almost forgotten that he had lived on that street mm -hmm. and failed the test. But if you're somebody who has memorized another person's identity thanks to these credit reports, mm -hmm. it's, you have access to every anything, every right. piece of identity. Yeah, everything, every place you've ever been, they've got it. Yeah, right. And it's like I lost my bank card, Harry. Mm -hmm. I went to over there and I said, "Listen, I lost my wallet. I can't find my ID. I can't find any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. I've got my Costco card. It's got my photo on it. It's kind of photo ID. This is me." <laughs> uh, and they were like, "That's not good. Let me ask you some questions." And they walked me through the questions, mm -hmm. and then I got it right. The other thing is those questions. When you have to fill in those questions, those are I'm going to swear script. Those are bullshit uh, things to fill in. Never put in real information on those security questions. Do not put in real information for those security questions. Put in, put in a password. Create something. I am telling you right there, right now, because you put a lot of that information there on freaking Facebook. It's that's the easiest way people social engineer, social engineer to get back to or into your email account is because, you know, what's the street I grew up in? Well, I don't know. Oak Road. Sweet. I'm in. Thanks. Right. You know, like, what's your what's your middle, what high school did you go to? Oh, you're posting about your ten year uh, uh, reunion. Thank you. Mom's maiden name. Mm -hmm. She's got it in parentheses on Facebook. Thanks. Thank you. You know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Do not please just put pat just create passwords for them. It's very very simple. I you know I've done a couple. You know a lot of them look goofy and like and when I say it to different people they ask me like so what's your dog's name and I say something ridiculous and they just like what. That's the correct answer. What, what was that about? I'm like, trust me, it's better this way, and I'm going to change that. <laughs> right. Uh, to add to the fact that these are scumbags, a high-level executive sold off almost $2 million of the company's stocks after finding out about the breach in late July, mm -hmm. weeks before they went public about the hacks, which prompted the company's stock to fall 18% as of this week. Including the CFO? To crown it all... <laughs> Equifax sought to make good with customers by offering free credit monitoring and identity theft protection. But any customers who took advantage of the deal might waive their right to a joint class action suit. 30 suits have been filed already. So, and the CEO was fired today. Yep. And, uh, okay, and, that, and the credit monitoring is just for a year. It's just for a year. Right. This, you'll have to – the crappy thing all about this is you're pwned and you're pwned probably f until they get up new to somehow you get all new numbers, which they all track back to those. So even if you got a new social security number, your old social security number is still traced with that other one. So like you're just kind of boned forever. And if you think you're going to go out like your class action shoots, probably your easiest, best way to do, like have harm to go after Equifax. If you try to sue on your own, you're going after a billion dollar industry. You're going to get pwned. Yeah. You, you can take them to your small claims court, but then you have to show proof that you are actually are harmed. You know, so yeah. this may work if if you when your identity gets stolen and you can actually prove this is all from that hack. Good freaking luck unless you get the hacker to admit to it. Doubt that'll happen. You know, so nothing's really going to happen to this other than somehow people, you know, find a way to opt out and just take down Equifax or just prove better security out of these people. And that's not going to happen. And the problem is they could go out of business and then we're left with two. Yeah. agencies and less is not good in this case correct yeah that's two gigantic honeypots and they're not gonna you know and they've been doing the 
we've been doing this for uh, over 100 years, and they have not increasing security. Yeah. Uh, Equifax, the other hack I kept talking about, they got hacked from payroll people because they had those crappy security questions on there and a quick, easy PIN number that was every easy to guess because most people use the same freaking PIN numbers. If It's the easiest way to hack a PIN number system. If you just get on Google and go, popular PIN numbers, you'll get a top 10 list of everyone's popular PIN list. If you look at that list, you will probably find your debit or credit card PIN number on that freaking list because it's easy to freaking memorize. I've so got they, the easiest PIN. I, I, no, I, I don't have an easy PIN. I've got a very secure PIN. Good. It's yeah. my childhood phone number. Nobody will ever guess it. But it's on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> no, said, no, I'm lying. I'm not that stupid. We know. Your uh, PIN number is the meal you usually get at Stack Pickle. <laughs> yes, the, the number the, – it's, it's, it's my Jimmy John's. It's my three favorite Jimmy John's orders. <laughs> but it's it. – <laughs> Now, you, you said this is a boomer problem. Uh, you invoked the boomers. I want to hear it. One, boomers like easy pin numbers, easy uh, – retrieve different things because most millennials are like, we're using password managers. Even when I brought up two-factor authentication, most of the millennials are probably like, well, duh, have we? we've had that for, you know, we've right. been using this for years. But boomers don't. They don't understand right. that crap. So they have these easy, like, password retrieval things because they're always forgetting things and don't use password freaking managers. So that a lot, that's an easy way for hackers to take and social engineer back in. Don't want to use hackers. They're actually crackers. Hackers are uh, heroes. These are crackers doing stuff in, Mel- um, you know, in Melbourne. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so. You're, you're very fired up right now. Oh, it's, it's freaking nuts. Like, because it's, it's it was very uh, – I didn't think it would be that easy to go after Equifax. And now, like, the the security officer, the lady that's doing it with her freaking music degrees. Now, I can understand how people jump into security doing other different means and not having, you know, like, I, I know people who are better in security than I am, and they have a philosophy degree. But right, I just, a lot of these stuff is such old hat that they they should have been developing better security. Right. And it just seems like. They just didn't care. They just kept collecting their money, staying in the background, and hope it, like they hoped the obscurity of the public was the security. That they they, they acted like a financial company. They yeah. just started rolling out new products, new products, new products mm-hmm. t- to get shareholder value. And the problem with shareholder value is you you, you roll out these new. <laughs> Rick Irvine says this is nuclear level autism, Harry. <laughs> you gotta, yeah, I'm trying to slow down. It's just so much, and it's it's, it's and it's all ridiculous. Yeah, and so. Essentially, a financial company just rolls out new products all the time, trying to they just they're just shuffling the the deck, trying to using the same different tactics and rebranding and remarketing, mm-hmm. and then you know things like security, which are expensive, that stuff gets left on the table because we've got to pay for the marketing for the new product. Correct, yeah. And so you've got to think like a secu- like LastPass mm-hmm. doesn't really do much marketing. Now, obviously, these are two very different companies and very different or scales. Or YubiKey. YubiKey right. doesn't do much marketing. Right. Like LastPass is a company that puts security first and marketing second, and mm-hmm. that's why they are – that's why I love them. That's why I use them. I mean it's – and you can tell that their value, their number one value is security. And when you look at this story and you read into Equifax, their value is, is shareholder value, which is mm-hmm. new product and not security. Correct. Yeah, yeah, and, and, it, and it, it's, it's so and I, frustrating. I know that because and, their CEO took a golden parachute in stock right at, right after yeah. the, the they were hit. Mm-hmm. And and you and it's this co- also this corporate culture that look at it it people and they want these huge they want these huge requirements of them because uh, perfectly honestly it's really really hard to find anyone that's in security that isn't on something. <laughs> And, right, and at, trying to get drugs. Them all, yeah, trying to get them to do a drug test or have to like to go to a different schedule. That's not going to freaking happen. Most of them aren't wanting to do that because there's other companies that's going to pay them more than you that will let them to do what they want. Right, <laughs> you know. But all right, so the couple of takeaways from all this, and you're like, all right, whatever. Harry, Harry's tech tip. Yeah. All right. Every well, week we give you a tech tip. We this, don't give. You, normally we don't let Harry get in as deep as this, but he's very passionate about it. And uh, you guys have asked all for the Equifax stuff, so I wanted to Harry, let Harry go d- a little deeper. And I'll leave you get a takeaway with you because I probably can't. I, there's no way I'm going to touch on everything here. And uh, no, you're not allowed to. Just the tip, Harry. But Give us the tip. The, bit, the thing you need to do is go to like a, uh, go get your credit report. Go to like annualcreditreport.com. Don't go to any of those jingle ones with the freaking jingles. 
and get your credit report, get that hard copy, and you're going to do this every year. You know, the reunion of this episode, you can just keep getting all your credit reports. You're going to keep that hard copy, and you, you want to, like, put that in your, in your safe. You also want to freeze your credit. Uh, you can try to do it on the website, but there's so many people in this country right now trying to freeze their credit. It's going to be hard, and you've got to do to all three credit unions, not just get – Equifax sucks. So you have to do them, and you have to do transfusion experience. You have to call them up, go through the different numbers, call up, and freeze your freaking credit. Yes, does it suck because you have to pay 30 bucks? Yes, it sucks to unfreeze because you got to be on the phone and do 30 bucks. but it's a lot easier than having to go through identity theft. And if you have to sit through and, um, have, you know, and if freezing your credit will – prevent you from buying a new car or buying something like that, then you probably shouldn't have bought this car <laughs> or bought or rented your freaking or rented a freaking 4K TV anyways. Now, <laughs> does it stop your credit cards? It doesn't. It doesn't do that. So like um that so that's my big thing is keep going Harry, I gotta turn the oven off. Oh. Is that is that what it is? I thought that was that cross burning <laughs> in the front yard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cold in here too. Can you turn the AC off it's too? It's sixty six degrees. Racist air conditioning. Thinks cat's not here. You can turn the AC down. Anyways, uh, so yeah, so go. Uh, the other places like uh, the take the biggest takeaway, like I want to tell from people, is a there's a Reddit user. Uh, you want to find it's uh, so if you go to Reddit.com/u/ uh, Velestdon V E L O S T D O N Velestdon or Velestdon or Velestdon. He did a very very good write up. I mean, this thing is like very well detailed. Uh, of everything that has happened I'm gonna go to the bathroom. that has happened and every like on oh, steps you need to take um some mods have removed it but you can find it they made a redirect site for it and it kind of goes through everything that has happened on the site and steps to help you basically limit the damage that you're going to take now granted like i said there's 143 people so the thing that you're going to get hit now possibly low but that doesn't do anything so you've got to take these steps down don't do nothing get anyone you know it's basically everyone you can touch basically if you know someone when it comes to halloween comes to thanksgiving they haven't frozen their credit they do not have their credit reports you know that's the conversation you need to have with these individuals. Screw your flag. Screw your freaking, like, football or what you want to do. You really want to worry about this because if you get your credit stolen, bad things can happen to you. Um, you know, I was, uh, I've was i watched so many people get their identity, identity stolen, and it just ruined every dream that they've had. Like, uh, this one lady was planning on starting a business, buying a house, and got her identity stolen, and all those dreams got put on the back burner. And I think she's just now... Uh, getting it all out of the hole. And it, it's, yeah, things have been like uh, almost five to six years of hell just trying to, you know, get, get her things back. The other thing with it, uh, this write-up is like if you don't have a copy of your birth certificate, get that done, get that all locked up because uh, the – because there's a lot of different states, like a lot of this information, they can get copies of your birth certificate too with all this information. They can get, and the other thing is with your, uh, the big, the other thing is like, well, I don't, I don't, if you're sitting out there like, well, Harry, I have terrible credit. You know, you couldn't, you know, I can't even get a credit card. I can't open things in my name. You know what they can also do with this, all this information? They can use it to f file a um, false tax return. So when you think of getting your tax return out there, or sorry, your theft return, and you think you're going to get this huge you know, <laughs> return on theft, guess what? It's not going to happen because someone could also file it for you. And you think – and don't think that there isn't a uh, – someone didn't write – they're not writing a Python script to fill out these forms in mass, all 143 names from that database. Don't think someone's not doing that right now. <laughs> and if you think that IRS theft returns uh, – uh, theft doesn't happen. There's Google addresses or DuckDuckGo addresses, uh, uh, address like a DuckDuckGo uh, articles about people like of houses who received 20 million different tax returns to one address. The IRS is a machine. They do not care. They will if you come in with the correct information, they will output the correct return and just send cash out. It's nuts. It's crazy. Sorry, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> you got, just caught. You need to. Uh, listen, collect yourself before you wreck yourself. Is that what the <laughs> phrase is? Is that what the kids say? All right, we got to wrap this up because we, this is the, we've gone 30 minutes over our time timeline. But I just want to say, uh, 
The Wall Street Journal reported Monday that Equifax spent $1.1 million last year lobbying against the regulatory laws, including the uh, data security and breach notification. Uh, there are reasons for a company to wait before going public. Uh, they're cooperating with law enforcement. They don't want to sabotage the invest investigation. Um, they don't know the extent of the damage. They don't want to cause panic, that sort of stuff. So... A lot, you know, six weeks may be excessive, but maybe it wasn't. We don't know. Representative Lou Correa, a Democratic representative from California, announced Tuesday he would introduce legislation to regulate data breach notifications. So more laws. Yeah, that's the other thing with it. It's uh, that whole like credit monitoring for a year. I was like, come on, you've released all these people's information for a year. What, 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 what? Is that information only valid for a year? Or are you going to keep that information valid for the rest of their freaking life? Right. All right, well, uh, you know, and they wouldn't have to worry about the information being stolen if you weren't collecting it, and if you were collecting, you were like correctly encrypting this information, you know. But if the information is like you don't care because it's not their information. Oh, sorry, Harry, are you okay? Are you gonna? <laughs> it's just so frustrating with like different people because like the techs out there, the the science is the the knowledge is out there, the security hardware is out there, and it just seems like a gross use of it. They just you, just like you said, they use their money for other things. Yep. All right, final thoughts for the episode, Harry. Once again, uh, I'm going to say that uh, the username right now, uh, if you go on reddit.com slash you slash Velestron, that the V-E-L-O-S-T-O-D-O-N, Velestron, and look at his write-up up there. It's really, really, it's a huge, lengthy write-up of everything different. Uh, um, I'll probably, like, post <laughs> that out there um, to get everyone get on to it. It is... It, like and see people, and if you see someone that like, like that's the main conversation is you should walk up to someone. Like, hey, frozen your credit yet? <laughs> Molestodon is uh, oh, Molestodon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, uh, Molestodon is Jared Jared Fogel's dinosaur. <laughs> All right. The other thing is. Um, oh my God! I thought I said one final thought, Harry. Oh, uh, sorry. I I have another one. I want to give a big shout out to everyone out in the Discord chat, especially the pretty pretty princess. Um, we uh, the Discord chat is a fun place for like just to wall people who get on just talk and game together trust me there's tons of different gamers out there i don't care if you're part of the pc gaming master race or you're one of the console peasants you're still welcome here we even let a casual uh mobile player uh, into the discord chat we don't care just come on come on hang out with us all right cool uh, my final thought is about the DACA kids. Uh, during a press conference, Senator Hatch uh, was talking about the DACA kids and said it was bad for the economy to deport the children of illegal immigrants. So that led me to think, Harry, that if it was bad to kick these 800,000 th 800, kids out uh, that span over 15 years, mm -hmm. wouldn't that mean that, they are, that immigrants are good for the economy? And – we benefited from them and their families more than they threatened us. The economy grew up around these immigrants and grew with those immigrants. Mm -hmm. They didn't steal anyone's job. The economy expanded because we had more people to work jobs, especially jobs that Americans don't want to do. So I went and looked up something, and this was uh, on Forbes, 7-21-2017, uh, DACA Dream Act 2017, New Immigration News. Uh, I, I forget – I wish I had the title of the article. Um, let me let me look real quick. It uh, f ending this immigration program would devastate the economy, and it was on Fortune, not Forbes. Should the program be terminated, however, the losses would be devastating. The same study estimates that ending DACA would reduce the nation's GDP by 433 billion over a decade. Another study by the Immigrant Legal Resource Center sh states that. 685,000 young immigrants would become un unemployed immediately, causing employers to incur $3.4 billion in costs associated with the termination and replacement of employees. Without DACA, tax revenue would be seriously impacted. Over the next decade, $24.6 billion in Social Security and Medicare contributions would be lost. So if losing those people, think of how many more people we would gain if we allowed more people into our country. So – Exactly. You, I think you muted your mic. All right. Thank you for joining us here on this episode of We Are Libertarians. Uh, sorry this one went a little longer, but, you know, we uh, jam-packed it with information. Hopefully you learned a lot. Uh, we are still looking to hear from you, the listener, on what you think of the, the second shows. 
You guys are always uh, so complimentary when you do write. Uh, we're always looking for – listen, I can take I can take constructive criticism. If you're an asshole, I'll block you. Uh, <laughs> Joshua Laughlin, I want to thank him uh, for a very nice note. I uh, just wanted to personally thank all of you, Chris and Greg especially, but also Kat and Harry, who have really helped keep the show fresh and interesting lately with all the new content you're putting out. I've been a listener for three years now, and though I'm a few episodes behind, I've listened to just about every every episode you've put out. I've enjoyed listening to Chris's character development these past three years as I struggled with the real possibility of a divorce in 2014 myself. 2017 has been the best year for the podcast by far, and as I've said before, you've really come into your own terms of putting out a phenomenal product that obviously many people enjoy. I have been supporting this podcast since I've been able to, have been financially able to, as well as two other podcasts that I found because of listening to We Are Libertarians. Recently, though, I've been listening to your podcast side by side with the Lava Flow, and uh, you know, we he he goes on to say that Roger's a bit intense and that uh, he and his wife can listen to us, whereas Roger scares her a little, which I totally get. Uh, he says he loves the bonus segments that you can get by being a subscriber to our Patreon, the little Easter egg stuff at the start and the end of the episodes, and the new Tuesday night episodes with Harry. You're really doing a great job making your group in- enticing and relatable. Sorry for the wall of text. Can't wait to catch up and hopefully catch a few of the live streams. Joshua Lachlan, thank you for that nice note. That is very much appreciated. You can write us at editor at We Are Libertarians. We want to hear what you have to say. And it's been so great to get to talk to so many of you, uh, and we love doing that with our audience. So please feel free to add us on anything. Yep. And uh, with that, we will say uh, – we will bid you adieu by saying – Greg will be back Thursday. <laughs>